We're live. It's Wednesday. It's one o'clock. We're here talking about music curation. This is our very first episode of Inside Music Curation. Today, we're answering the question, what is music curation? Thought it'd be a great way to start this off. Uh, we are the team at Feed Media Group. I've got some amazingly talented folks with me today. I've got Lauren Puffpaff, our COO, also a uh, house music fanatic and has a massive vinyl collection. She's a stellar DJ, so we're very fortunate there. Um, we've also got Dario Slavaza, our curator um, lead. He's a musicologist, ethnomusicologist, and multi-instrumentalist. Dario really does it all. So excited to have him here too. And uh, Eric Stensvog, Stens as we like to call him, our curator and writer. He's a classically trained music history buff and a hip hop DJ. So here to answer all of your questions, uh, let's just start off, dive right in. What is music curation? Lauren, can you give us some background there? Of course, thanks, Melissa, happy to be here. So the, the driest possible definition, like the most pedestrian way to think about it, is that you select and organize music for an experience. But it's really so much more than that, right? You're, you're actually creating an atmosphere and oftentimes trying to change energy, whether you're bringing it up or down. And if you think about it from, like think about your pers a personal experience, so like curating a music set for a party. You know, you would think about what time of day is it taking place? Who's coming? What's the mood I'm trying to set? And then you'd go about picking tracks, se sequencing them to create an arc for the vibe you're going for throughout the duration of the event. But then also, you know, you have to be ready to change things on the fly. If the vibe is off, the mood's off, different people show up. Like that's part of, I think, the beauty of live curation is that you plan so that you can react on the fly to people. But today, what we are talking about really is business to business music curation, which bring it's a whole different animal, to be honest, because you are it's typically being the the music is being listened to asynchronously. So you don't you're not getting live feedback from the listener. And and there's a, a whole different set of variables to think about when it's in a business to business scenario. So the team will go into this more, but of course they're thinking about who is the listener? What are they doing when they're listening? Are they driving? Are they working out? Are they meditating? And then, and then you get to add two additional variables. One is what's the brand? So who is, who is the brand that is sharing this music with their customer? What do they represent? What do they care about? And you also, we are also able to incorporate data. So what does the data that I have from years now of building soundtracks tell me about what will help make this a really great experience for the user? So B2B, it's, it's the experience, but creating it at scale. Yeah, definitely. Dario, do you want to dig in a little bit to the, the data, the science side of it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that is one of the differentiating factors here, right, is that, you know, if you're just picking music, whether you're DJing or, you know, even just to play at a party in a bar, it's more feel, right? Whereas we luckily have the benefit of getting actual direct feedback from users and also over time, right? And that's something that is, it's invaluable in that sense and allows you to make informed decisions about, as Lauren said, those particular brands and those particular brands users, you know? There are songs that may be popular and in the zeitgeist, but for this particular use case and for these users, it doesn't really click and gel. And aside from anecdotal information, having the hard numbers of this is how many times it's been played, this is how many times people skip it, they don't listen to the whole song, maybe it's even at a certain portion in the song, that sort of data, that sort of data over time. I was just having a conversation with someone earlier today as well about artists that the perception changes over time and having that in numbers, we're talking about Sean Paul, is you know blossoming as an artist, the sort of down period and his resurgence in now and throwback and older stations and seeing how he performs in those and having numbers to correlate with that is, is really, really important. Awesome, any other points on data? Stens, do you wanna chime in? Well, I guess I'm gonna talk about it a little bit as well in terms of our process, but the, the data is really helpful and we're really lucky that we have 
actual playback data that, you know, I think it's not a coincidence that all three of us literally DJ on the side for fun. So, I mean, I definitely think that having a DJ background is a really good transferable skill into curation, but as opposed to people coming up and interrupting your set, hopefully not when you're queuing up the next record, to tell you that they want to hear this Jay-Z song, you know, we actually can see, you know, oh, well, they don't want to hear this Kanye song, or, you know, we rarely get skips on, on Jay-Z, so let's use more Jay-Z. I mean, that stuff's really awesome. Uh, we try to be artists and genre agnostic, so we're just trying to infer as much as we can about people's, you know, listening preferences, and it's a fun detective element of the job is how we kind of marry the analytics into what psychologically or psychographics the listeners may have. What stands out is one big difference that we talk about a lot between personal DJing, where it is your taste that you're reflecting and curating for businesses. You kind of have to leave your taste to the, put it to the side. You have to table it and, you know, obviously put the user and the brand first, which is something that we look for when we hire for curators as well. Yeah. And, I, and I'd say too, the big thing is the numbers and the analytics are important, but it, what takes it a step beyond is be able to draw insights from those numbers. And that's what is, you know, algorithms are great and those sorts of things are very useful and functional, but layering that human element on top of it and putting those two together is really where you get magic. Awesome. Since you want to kind of parlay that into, you know, what our process is and, and how we approach curation at Feed Media Group. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'll just start by just quickly stepping back and looking at our philosophy, which Dario and Lauren have already alluded to a lot, but just to compliment that, I mean, first and foremost, everyone who's a curator at, at uh, Feed Media Group brings vast music knowledge and a lifelong passion for music. So, I mean, this is a dream job and we recognize that, you know, there's some jobs that are jobs, you know, I've, I've had jobs, I've been grateful to have jobs and get a paycheck, but to be able to do this where I'm learning about music every day, I'm using that knowledge, you know, I'm, I'm getting to use these kind of musicological matchmaking skills in utilitarian ways and in a lot of ways that enhance and benefit people's lives and make them, you know, a more positive and happier and healthier life is, is not only a, a incredibly fun profession, but it's a privilege and something I think that we can bring our whole selves into the job. And there's a lot of joy that we have in our job that that comes through maybe indirectly through the, uh, curation we do. Um, just to get a little more into the how of, of how we leverage those things, I think it's it's really three things when we do curation. It's today's pop charts. I mean, pop is king. You know, most listeners listen to pop, and um, that proves out in the metrics of, of what we use in terms of our stations. People just love pop music. So today's pop charts, proprietary analytics, which we've talked about quite a bit, skip rates, things like that, and then nuanced cultural uh, context. Um, those elements of song selection that you can't easily outsource to an algorithm uh, or machine learning. And just to give an example of that would be the last several years, all the conversations around uh, cancel culture, which are really important. And so there's no hard and fast rules that we use. We don't have kind of institutional policies about we can't play R. Kelly or we can't play you know, Michael Jackson or we can't play um, Morgan Wallen or, or some people that have come under you know, um, the microscope for some of their either on stage or off stage antics, but we all have to be aware of that. And we have to have sensitivity to maybe how our listeners will feel about that. Um, and also like maybe sometimes people do want to hear a Michael Jackson song, but for a kid's dance station, like, you know, maybe not. So I think those, those nuances are really, really important. Um, just to talk about our process, um, you know, we go through a fairly, um, involved process when we create stations for our partners, we're able to step through it pretty quickly because we've been doing it for a long time and we have so many customers. But at the outset, we collaborate with all of our business partners to determine specific music stations. And that's a combination of genre and or intensity based. Um, a lot of our partners are fitness companies, so they might want just straight intensity based you know, BPM based of how fast it is, or they might want to overlay that on top of genre. So there's a lot of different ways that you can basically um, slice and dice, you know, the world of music. It's a, it's a vast, it's a vast playing field we have to work with. Um, so we need to understand, as Dario had said earlier, the context for this music, and then what music stations they think they want. Then we learn as much as possible about the user's demographics. 
uh, the end user's demographics and their music tastes, which we then represent on a customer by customer basis versus imposing our own preferences. That's, I think that representation of the brand and the end user is one of the value propositions we bring. And it's part of our philosophy is like, hey, I might not love Justin Bieber, but if they're loving Justin Bieber, I'm going to play Justin Bieber. You know, That's the music that's going to motivate them or be effective. Um, next, we build small sample stations from each customer for each customer, excuse me. And we work with the uh, content team to get specific feedback. Like, how did we do? We found out the hard way that the closer we can set that curation target to precision on the outset versus like kind of, oh, they like hip hop. Let's throw this in here. And then three months later, you know what? Let's do something different. We really want to step them through that and get clarity of what do you mean by hip hop? What do you mean by throwback? And then finally, once we have that feedback loop from the content teams, we'll create full stations with a minimum of 40 tracks apiece. Um, and then finally, just to touch quickly on like what happens next? Do we just, here's your stations, have a great year. Well, hell no. I mean, the pop charts change so quickly, that would be a suboptimal experience. So we monthly, usually monthly, we regularly assess all of the stations. Each of us as curators, we have a customer portfolio and we look into it. We make informed decisions about additions and removals um, for two reasons. One, we want to keep the stations fresh. And two, which is a really fun side benefit, we get more and more a sense of really what this customer wants. So the, the ongoing process every month of revisiting, you know, Nautilus or Tonal or, you know, any one of our American Eagle, we get a better sense of what their listeners really want, sometimes maybe even than they do. Um, so, and then I guess the last thing I would add, because we have some Q&A is that, you know, there's a spectrum of kind of AI or data-driven curation and human-driven curation, and every music streaming company falls on that spectrum. We tend to lean a little bit more on the human side. And as Dario recently said, um, it's more of a fine art like cooking. You know, we have recipes, we have tools to work with, but to get the best, most expert and tastiest flavors is really going to be a human dimension that we try to always overlay onto the data. Yeah, Dario, do you want to add to the, the optimization or to the human element a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's something that I always use an anecdote of, <clears throat> you know, the song Deo, Harry Belafonte, its inclusion in Halloween playlists, and how if you look at that on paper makes no sense. But if you understand the broader cultural expectation that this is in Beetlejuice, and it has this sort of connotation for a whole generation of people, it makes a lot of sense. I don't want other Calypso music in my Halloween playlist, but I do want these particular songs from this soundtrack, you know, and, and bringing that on a more nuanced perspective to our customers from the analytics, but also just what's happening in the world and what's happening in the music world. We had a slump, I'd say about a year to two years ago, where pop music became really depressing and slowed down. And for fitness companies, that's a really hard trend to deal with when it's happening music wide. And so we shifted a lot of our customers to remixes or to, you know, other things outside of the normal sphere of pop music for a while to really help them navigate that as opposed to just having to be forced to listen to what was really happening in the zeitgeist of music at the time. You know, it's since picked up and now it's a, a little bit more on the up tempo side and, you know, dance pop is really coming back in. But being able to see those trends as they're happening and if, if better ahead of time and to prepare for them is something that takes a, an active engagement with the music, with the analytics and with our, our customers. Melissa, we can't hear you. <laughs> Anything else that you want to add uh, to talk about our process a bit, Lauren? Well, I actually slightly different slant on it. I think one of the things that's been most enjoyable for me as we build the team and, and add additional personalities to the mix is just seeing the interaction between the team. So question to Dario and Stins, how do you leverage each other or what? how do you lean on each other as you're figuring things out curatorially? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all we're all our own volumes of encyclopedias, mm -hmm. but there are whole worlds of music beyond each of us. And so I think in that sense, 
not just even, you know, Stins and I had a conversation about, you know, Kanye West's discography earlier today, and we both have similar views and there's crossover, but also have very different experiences with it. And so I think being able to lean into everybody's past experiences in different genres and even in different music cultures is invaluable in that sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's if, I could add, if I could add really, really quickly, I think, you know, diversity within companies, diversity within culture is critically important in general. Like companies know they perform better when they're diverse companies, but in the world of music cur curation or any place else that's about art, it's just absolutely essential. So we need diversity as a team in terms of representation and in terms of our preferences and perspectives in order that we can even be effective to try to canvas this huge thing that is music. Yes, calling all female curators. We're looking for you. Yeah, and as a non-curator on the team, I just I can't say how much I appreciate being able to lean into your expertise as well. Even though we're remote, you know, we've got Slack channels, our virtual water cooler, and the, the conversations are always intriguing and interesting. And it's it's great to tap into to music sources that I haven't tapped into before and, and hear about all the latest trends. So thank you for sharing that. Nice byproduct. Yes. Well, excellent. This is this is inside the music curation. Inside music curation, we'll be back um, every other Wednesday talking about topics from genres to use cases, folks we might be curating for, um, music you're, we're curating with, and we hope that you'll join us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, and you can find out more information about Feed Media Group at feedmediagroup.com. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye.